Folks, Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punches! A real uh, revolutionary right now. Support this man, Black Star Network. 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 Black Star
black media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of black America, Roller. Hey, black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hey folks, today is Thursday, October 13th. Sorry, October 12th, October 13th, 2022. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network, a case out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, where Donovan Lynch shot and killed by a cop in 2021. Now, his family has filed a federal lawsuit against the city. We'll talk with the attorney, former Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax of Virginia, as well as Donovan's father, about this case. Also, today, January 6th uh, committee gave their final public hearing. Fo folks showed damning evidence that Donald Trump absolutely was involved and engaged in starting this riot, this uh, white domestic terrorist, on January 6, 2021. They also showed riveting video of members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, uh, uh, sitting here calling for help and how he sat in his dining room and just watched it unfold and didn't do a damn thing. They also have issued a subpoena for him to testify before the committee. Also uh, on today's show, uh, we'll talk about the election, folks. A lot of new ads uh, uh, coming out. 27 days until the election. Democrats are increasingly concerned about Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin. Also, Dr. Oz is closing fast on John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. Democrats are also shifting money to Sherry Beasley in North Carolina. Tim Ryan, he destroyed J.D. Vance in their last debate. He is in the lead there. But again, it is tight across the board in all these Senate races and also in the House as well. So we'll break down what is going on uh, in the campaign as well as uh, the Election Defenders Coalition, uh, what is happening to protect rights uh, to voters. Folks, Democratic nominee for governor uh, in uh, Maryland, Wes Moore, will join us to talk about his campaign, not getting lots of attention. He very well could become the third African-American governor elected since Reconstruction. Also, in today's marketplace, folks, uh, we'll talk to Body by Chris. She says she has products that can actually get you to slim down and make your butt larger and without BBL, without Brazilian butt lift. Really? Yeah, we'll talk about her products as well. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. It's on go, 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 y'all. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. All right, folks, normally when it comes to uh, a police shooting, we will be showing you the video right now, but in the case of Donovan Lynch in Virginia Beach, Virginia, there is none. Why? Because the officer did not turn on the body camera. That is one of the issues uh, that people are highly critical as it relates to this particular case. Uh, it was a shocking case, this young man uh, who was shot in March of 2021. Now, the officer involved, Solomon Simmons, was cleared of any wrongdoing, but Lynch's family is suing the officer and the city for wrongful death. The former Virginia Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax has joined Lynch's legal team. He and Donovan's father, Wayne, join us right now. Uh, glad to have both of you here. Uh, Justin, let me start with you. First and foremost, yeah. again, I started with 
How in the world there's no body cam footage? Don't officers there actually have body camera? What happened? Yeah, Roland. Well, again, thank you for highlighting this case. Uh, the officers do have body cameras, uh, but as you mentioned, the officer who unlawfully killed uh, Donovan Lynch uh, in March of 2021 did not have his body camera on and activated. And the uh, department has since uh, changed its policy and required that they be on, but it, it shows you the amount of negligence and gross negligence and the uh, killing uh, of Donovan. And there was so much more. Uh, there was actually no warning given to Donovan Lynch before he was shot and killed. And so this officer, within roughly seconds of encountering Donovan uh, and coming upon him, gives him no warning, does not have his body camera activated, shoots him twice, fatally, uh, and then they render little to no aid. Uh, and as others have pointed out, uh, they also left his body there for an inhumane amount of time. Uh, he was murdered roughly around midnight uh, of that night. It wasn't until 9 a.m., roughly. Uh, that his body was then moved uh, to uh, a place away from the scene. And so, you know, this really is a horrific case. Uh, it is one where Wayne Lynch, his extraordinary father, uh, has fought this fight for a very long time. I was honored to join as the lead legal counsel here and to fight for justice for Donovan, for this Lynch family that suffered for so long. Uh, and I'm joined in this fight by Thomas B. Martin, one of the finest lawyers in America. And we really are focused on getting justice. Uh, for this family and correcting these policies so that this does not happen to any other family in Virginia Beach, uh, anywhere in America. And really, the eyes of the world are on Virginia Beach right now. It has got to rise to this moment. Donovan should be here with us today. He should not have been killed uh, in the negligent and grossly negligent way in which he was. And not a single one of us, Roland, not a single member of the Virginia City Beach uh, City Council, uh, or the police department or any one of the 1.2 million uh, citizens there in Virginia Beach would want their child uh, to, when they go out to the ocean front, just have dinner with their best friend and are walking back to their car to go home, to have them be come upon by an officer, shot without a warning, within seconds, with no body camera, and left there essentially to die. Uh, this has got to be corrected right now in this moment, uh, and we're going to get justice for Donovan. Um, Wayne, um, what happened here was, was Donovan involved in something as related to when the shooting took place, or was he simply an innocent bystander? Walk us through what happened on that fateful night. Uh, yes, Roland, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, Donovan has not been involved in any, I would say again, any illegal, criminal, or other activity throughout his whole life. He's always been a model student, a model citizen, an outstanding friend, a great scholar, entrepreneur, an athlete, and an advocate, and a change agent. Only thing Donovan did that night was, I would say, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But what happened to him was totally uh, unnecessary. Um, he did not pose a threat. They have not once said what he was uh, ac actually doing to cause his death. Um, we know he was not committing any crimes. He was leaving the, the um, restaurant with his friend after a night out. And when he came out, it was a lot of chaos, and he was just getting out of the way, sir. And, and, and that's the thing right there, um, Justin, that is, that is so strange here. Right. Um, right. That, you know, you know, in this chaotic scene, an officers, officer says nothing, and now... Uh, we have to now rely on witnesses and and what they have to say, as opposed to having that having that body cam footage. And the reason police departments um, went to body cam footage is to be able to show in real time what actually happened, as opposed to relying on a police officer's account, where we know for a fact they oftentimes lie. Well, Roland, you're exactly right when you say that this is the whole point of body cameras. Uh, the entire point was for us to be able to see exactly what happened so that judgments could be made about whether uh, what the officer did was warranted or justified. And in this case, we know from reasons outside of body camera uh, that the actions were not justified, that, as Wayne said, Donovan should be alive. He was engaged in no illegal activity. Uh, he was simply uh, an, an innocent person, a law-abiding citizen, uh, walking back to his car. Uh, who got caught up uh, in the middle of some other activity that others were engaged in. But uh, this also, I think, is critical as well. Uh, the officer who shot and killed Donovan, uh, Solomon Simmons, uh, actually knew him. Uh, they had gone to school together a long time ago for one year in the ninth grade. 
Uh, and Donovan was a very recognizable person. Everybody loved him. He was 6'4", 305 pounds, not to be mistaken for anyone else. And to add to the negligence of the situation, you have an officer who actually had had prior contact with Donovan, they actually gone to school with him, and yet even with that knowledge of who he was, shot him within seconds. Uh, and again, this has got to be ground zero for police reform, and there have already been some reforms uh, in the wake of Donovan's killing. And I think uh, if we look at this, uh, they now are mandating the body cameras be turned on. This was done very shortly after uh, Donovan's shooting. Uh, and they made some other reforms with a civilian uh, review board in Virginia Beach. And so that, to me, is really an acknowledgement that, that there were so many things wrong here. Um, but we have got to fight for justice for Donovan, because really fighting for justice uh, for all of us. I have, uh, and my wife, a 12-year-old son and an 11-year-old daughter. And if they want to go out to the beach, uh, they want to hang out with their friends and just come back uh, to their car and ride with their friends and then come home, they should be able to do that and do that safely. They should come home to us. And every family, every mother, father, grandmother, grandmother, aunt, uncle, should expect the exact same thing. So what Virginia Beach is saying uh, in this moment is that really nothing needs to be done uh, with the Lynch family. We're done here. Uh, and, you know, we, we can litigate this if you'd like, but, but I think we've uh, established that, that we're going to do nothing else. And I think that's wrong. Uh, and I think we now have a chance right now to uh, make a statement. And as you know, Roland, I'm a former federal prosecutor. I've litigated in the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, tried cases, and uh, am ready to make sure we get justice however long it takes for Donovan and for his family. But it's also a moment right now where the Virginia Beach City Council, uh, its leadership can step up, uh, can proactively step up and rise to this moment. We've seen this around the country. Uh, we saw it in Minneapolis uh, when, of course, George Floyd uh, was horrifically murdered. Uh, unjustifiably. Uh, we saw it when another citizen in uh, Minneapolis was murdered. Uh, in that case, it was a, a white female uh, who was unlawfully murdered by the police. And their city council stepped up and, and got to uh, a quick uh, settlement, but also wanted to make sure that they were made whole and that they reformed their policies and that people were held accountable. There has been no accountability in this case whatsoever. Donovan uh, has left us, in the earthly sense, for over a year and a half. Uh, and people, you know, are saying, well, what's to be done and throwing their hands up? Well, there's a lot to be done. Uh, and it starts with not only the reforms that need to be made to make sure this never happens again, uh, but with making this family whole, uh, not sitting back idly by and silent, but standing up in this moment uh, and rising to uh, the better angels of our nature. We have got to make the Lynch family whole. We have got to reform these policies. And this should never, ever happen again in Virginia Beach, anywhere in Virginia or anywhere in the United States of America. Um, and, and, and that's the thing right there, uh, Wayne, that, that, that just drives me crazy in that, and I keep trying to explain to people when these things happen, you can't come back from death. This isn't, right. isn't somebody who's been shot. This is not the case in, 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 in Texas where the kid is in the car uh, eating a hamburger and the officer fires shots. He does get injured, but he gets hospitalized. Death is death. And, right. and, and, there's, and there's two callous... Uh, of, an, a, a two, of an attitude, and frankly, when these DAs just go, oh, no wrongdoing. I, I don't understand how in the hell somebody uh, can be accidentally shot, wrongfully shot, and then nothing happens to the cop as if, oh, sorry, they're dead, right. my bad. Right, 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 that's right. That's right, Roland. It's, it's, it's outrageous, and it's got to stop, because here, here's the problem, Roland. If we do not take substantial action here, uh, and if the city council does not step up, again, proactively, not sit on their hands, not wait and see uh, the tides and the winds, and we know that the more uh, the media has looked into this, the more the eyes of the world have been on Virginia Beach. We know that that's made some folks very uncomfortable, but they can't sit in silence. I'd, I'd love for them to come out proactively and say, you know what, this was wrong. We're not going to simply hide behind uh, a litigation process. And again, we are fully prepared and ready to go uh, to do that. But it's been a year and a half. How much more does this family have to suffer? How many more seconds, hours, days, weeks, and months does the Lynch family have to live with this pain and with the reality that a lot of folks are simply standing by and saying there's nothing to be done? It's outrageous. And that's why, really, I was honored uh, to become the lead counsel here in this case, uh, again, joined by Thomas B. Martin, uh, just a great lawyer. And, and the reason that we are fighting so hard, uh, you heard it in the voice of Wayne Lynch, uh, who is, again, an extraordinary man. He
He raised Donovan for 25 years. Every second poured his heart and soul into this incredible young man, college-educated, entrepreneur, uh, gave so much to his community and said that he was going to change the world. Well, he is changing the world, but we need everyone to step up right now in this moment. We can't simply replay the exact same thing over and over and over again, because guess what? On March 26, 2021, it was Donovan Lynch. Uh, the next day, it was someone else. The next yep. day, it's someone else. Tomorrow, will be somebody else. It's got to stop. Wayne, final comment. Yes, I, I really do agree um, with Justin is saying. We have got to get uh, control of what's happening in our communities as far as the gun violence uh, and also police brutality. Um, like I said earlier, my son had nothing to do with anything uh, that occurred there. And they were just uh, out with his friend for a night out after a long, um, long pandemic uh, season. And he was um, one of a kind, Roland. He was uh, a father's dream. And I just uh, want everyone to know that uh, Donald was the kind of person Donald was, not how they portray him. Well, we certainly uh, appreciate both of you joining us, Wayne. Again, so sorry for your loss. I hate that we have to do these stories over and over and over again. But all right, well, I, got, I got some other stories that I want to talk to you about, too. I got his foundation, <laughs> that we're doing great things at yeah. his foundation. Okay. All right. Well, be sure to send us that information, uh, and we Thank certainly you. appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. Roland. Appreciate Thank you, brother. Thanks for being such a leader, Roland. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. We're bringing in my pound, Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, to, to, uh, to Run Walker, founder of Context Media, Dr. Neambi Carter, associate professor, University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Uh, the, the thing here, and I, I just say it right there, uh, Greg, uh, is that I hate having to do these stories. I hate having to show these videos. I've had people say to me, Oh, you know, this is uh, this is traumatizing. We, we, we can't keep showing this. Uh, but I absolutely believe we make a mistake now I, if we don't do that. Now, I believe when mainstream media does it and does not provide the level of context and gives the level of depth to the stories, uh, then then they're playing off of that. Uh, but the thing here is this. If we start acting as if these things don't happen, then I believe the public then goes, well, it's out of sight, out of mind. I go back to, I always, th I always think about um, Mamie Till Mobley. The movie is opening uh, next week. And, and even on that particular point, it's a bunch of people already saying a bunch of BS about, oh, this is re-traumatizing us. They don't actually show the lynching in the movie. Uh, that, was by the, made, that was a point made by the director. She was not going to show that uh, again. But if we do not keep the focus on this, people are going to act as if, hey, we're all good. These things just don't happen. That's why we have to make sure that this stuff stays in the forefront uh, of, of people's minds. Absolutely, Roland. And um, <clears throat> the Emmett Tills, uh, the, the lynchings that we are more familiar with, and even those that we aren't as familiar with that have become historical, the bombing of Harry Moore and Harriet Moore's house, uh, on Christmas night that killed both of them in Florida. These are almost kind of like signposts. But really, what this story kind of re reiterates, the Donovan Lynch story, is the ordinariness of Black death. Mm. And I think this is what people are trying to tune out and evade. This, uh, to, to quote Slick Rick in another context, this type of shit that happens every day and the simple fact of the matter is that you have to do what you're doing. Of course you don't want to do this. But we have almost become immune in some ways to mm -hmm. the idea of black death. And it is this ordinariness. I mean, in this case, of course, uh, good to see Brother Fairfax back out there on the battlefield with his original uh, sword, which, of course, is his law degree, and to see him on the side of the angels. And, of course, they've approached the Department of Justice, and we know what they're going to say down there, Virginia Beach. The standard defense, they've already floated it. We, we uh, train our officers, uh, and we do it, and they had proper training, which means they're going to hang this guy out to dry if they can and say, basically, he violated the rules. But that's not enough. Finally, it's the cumulative effect of telling these stories to bust through this kind of, uh, uh, in, in a sense, this kind of almost becoming immune to these stories. You have to tell them, and you have to tell not just the same story over and over again, as in the case of Emmett Till. We have to tell that story again, of course. But you have to now allow the cumulative weight of this assault on Black life to collapse the chest of this system, because we're at an inflection point in this country. There's no doubt about it.
You know, um, Toron, there's so many of these stories, and they most of the time involve black black men. There are cases that also involve uh, black women. The Pamela Turner case is an example. That cop was acquitted. Hopefully, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division is going to hit this guy with civil rights civil rights charges. Um, and, and I absolutely understand black pain and, and, and what we endure. Um, but I use a George Floyd example. If, if we did not have to watch over almost nine minutes his life being snuffed out, there's no way in the world that story had the impact that it did if, if the world was not forced to actually watch it. And, and, it, and it's painful that it has to happen that we have to have another black death. Um, but what we cannot do is let the rest of these people get off by saying, no, 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 we're not going to show it. We're not going to talk about it. Uh, you know, we're just going to just mention it. No, 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 no. This has to be in the forefront. And we must use these videos, use these stories as an example of folks, stop, stop saying there are a few bad apples because it can't just keep happening and happening, and happening, and happening, and it's just a few bad apples. Well, as you said, it is enraging to have to go through this almost every day now, where it seems like there's a new death every other week. Um, the sad thing about all this is that this is in the best American tradition. What you're seeing now is a continuation of everything we've seen ever since the time we landed on these shores up until especially after Reconstruction, when the Klan became resurgent, and there were lynchings every day. And this is in the tradition of the Ida Wells School of Journalism, where she made a point of saying that there was a man lynched every day, and she put that in the face of the white power structure. She put that in the face of the black um, complacent power structure as well. The sad, the, what's sickening about this is that what you're seeing is not so much a pushback against these things being shown, what you're seeing is the short attention span of the general public, and unfortunately, the black general public as well, because if you don't put stories in front of people on a daily basis, things become out of sight, out of mind. In the wake of George Floyd, that, there was sort of a groundswell of awareness around the world about the plight of black people in America and what we were dealing with against the police. Um, now that some of that energy is kind of dwindled away, and now that some of that uh, passion and some of those daily stories have kind of gone away, People have gone back to being complacent, and it's almost like the way you see in other populations when it comes to school shootings and mass shootings. It's become so complacent in American society, so of course it would be, make sense for the killing of black men and black women by police to be complacent in, in American life as well, because that barely gets any mention all anyway. Now, two things here. Even if we take away the idea of this black man being wrongfully killed, there were so many police procedure, police procedural failures that happened that are more than enough to get this officer called to account. For instance, why was his body camera turned off? If that is supposed to be received procedure, why was he violating that procedure? What happened up until the point that that man lost his life that we don't see? The other part of that is, you know how hard it is to get a conviction of a police officer, even when there's footage, even when there's video. There's no telling how hard this is going to be to try to get a conviction or even get charges brought against this officer with, with just he said and he, she say and his word against, um, against this man's family. It's going to be, it's going to be horrific. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to say is this. There, what, whatever that gentleman was doing, whatever he, whatever he was, whether he was guilty or innocent, whether he was a good person or a bad person, none of that matters. If you have a suspicion of somebody in, in, in the middle of any wrongdoing, you have a responsibility as a police officer to follow the law when you're apprehending a citizen. You have the responsibility to respect the rights of anybody you're thinking about questioning. What we're seeing now is the fact that your black skin is a weapon. It doesn't matter whether you have a gun or not. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you are guilty or innocent. In this country, your black skin is a weapon. If you're a black male, your skin is doubly a weapon, and we have to be aware of that. So talking about that and making the general public aware of that is what we have to keep doing. The, um, you know, you know uh, Niambe, as we sit here and, and look at um, these efforts to drive more funding, uh, right now, Republicans are beating Democrats over the head on the issue of crime. One of the reasons 
the races in North Carolina, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in Florida uh, have uh, gotten even closer is because of the blitz of ads by Republicans about crime, crime, crime. And they've been able to, to weaponize, defund the police uh, and beat Democrats over the head. I mean, Keith Ellison, the guy who literally led the prosecution of the cops who killed George Floyd, uh, is in an absolutely tough, close race in Minnesota because the sheriffs in that state have, have weaponized his son as one of the defund the police leaders and are beating him over the head with that. But what, and I, and what I keep saying is, but they say nothing about cases like this. Mm -hmm. They say nothing about those families uh, who don't have a loved one sitting across from them at the dinner table. They say nothing about any of that as if that didn't happen. And then it's kind of like, well, you know, those are, th those things happen and they're rare. Y you can't tell a mother or a father who can no longer hug their loved one, hey, sorry, these type of shootings are rare. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not rare. That's the thing, Roland, because we only talk about the murders. We don't talk about the number of people who've been harmed and maimed by police uh, gunfire. So that's part of it. But I think the fact that we even have to sit here and talk about what a good young man Donovan Lynch was or what a nice boy Dante Wright was or what a good woman Sandra Bland was tells us something about the dehumanization that we experience in this country. The police are just a manifestation of the way we talk and treat Black people in this country. And when we do, you know, the, the few bad apples thing and we can feel proud about ourselves for trotting out the Derek Chauvin's of the world and, you know, th this this officer here in Virginia Beach, all we're doing is leave the foundation of white supremacy untouched, which is why after reform, after reform, after saying we need to do policing from a human rights perspective and, and ensure the dignity of all people and all of this stuff, we can still see the murders of our loved ones, of our children, of our community members happening every single day. The shootings, the beatings, right? The blatant disrespect. So we focus on the sort of more spectacular elements of this, which are the sort of murders because of the finality. And I'm like everybody else. I mean, there are some that just catch you off guard and you can never shake it. But what about the number of people who are beaten in our communities, who are fearful? Because we know there are officers right now in DC, for example, who've been reinstated to the police force, currently getting a check, who've been labeled a threat to the community. So this is not something that we can just say, oh, you know, there are a few bad apples. This is a practice and a pattern, right, in our country when we talk about law enforcement and when we talk about our communities, for example, we can use it politically. I mean, police officers are one of the few agencies that can get all the funding in the world with no proof that anything that they're doing is actually helping Right? Like, all we have to do is say, there's more crime, we need more money. And somehow it, there always seems to be more money for police, less money for social programs, less money for poverty reduction, less money for affordable housing, all the things that we know make for safer, healthier communities all the way around, not just where crime is concerned. And we know when people say crime in races, whether it be Maryland or Pennsylvania or anywhere else, who they're talking about. Right. Crime is just a dog whistle because that's one way to get people riled up yep. to think about black folks. And then, you know, ta-da. But here's the deal. We're going to talk about it later. But the reality is that has always been very effective with white voters in this country. Oh, absolutely. Uh, hold, For sure. That's uh, what I mean. Yeah. Hold tight one <laughs> second, folks. We're going to talk about crime next. And that is those white domestic terrorists who committed massive amounts of crime on January 6th. Damning video released today by the January 6th committee. We're going to talk about that also. Again, we'll, we'll break down what is happening politically. We are 27 days away from the midterm elections and the races are getting closer. It's tighter. That's so much that is at stake. Uh, Republicans desperately want to take over the House as well as the United States Senate. Democrats are trying to hold on to at least one of those chambers. It's 50-50 in the Senate. Uh, and again, the odds of them holding onto the House are slim as well. And so we'll talk about that, the impact of, of really what's happening in the election. Uh, and so a lot more to cover right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. First of all, if y'all watching on YouTube right now, almost 2,000 folks, why we, got 2, 000, why we don't have 2,000 likes? Y'all, this is real simple. If you pop on and watch, click the like button. It ain't that hard. 
and so does click the doggone like button. When I come back from this break, I should see 2,000 likes, okay? And understand, when you click that like, that has an impact on the video being recommended in the YouTube algorithm, which also drives the revenue for the show. And so I'm not just asking you for it because I want to see some likes. That also helps us economically when it comes to this show. Now, if you want to download the Black Star Network app, uh, we should. We, there's no reason we shouldn't be at 50,000 downloads right now. Uh, Keenan, send me a, a text. Let me know where we are at right now with our uh, downloads. Keenan is my digital guy. Uh, but you should download the app, folks. That's where all of our shows, all of our content, not just my show, Project Muhammad show, shows from Deborah Owens, Jackie Hood, Martin, uh, from uh, Stephanie Humphrey, from Greg Carr, and Rolling with Rolling are all on the platform, plus uh, all of our specials, all of the other things that we cover. And so everything that we do is right there on the app. Download it on Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, the dollars you give to support this show allows us to do what we do. Uh, so please support us financially. Send your checks and money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com uh, and folks uh, if you give during the show uh, to Cash App, PayPal, Venmo or Zill, I'll shout you out during the show. Our goal is to get 2,000 people this month contributing at least 50 bucks each uh, to raise $100,000. Uh, again, I told y'all last night uh, the monthly expenses to do what we do is $184,000. Okay? That's real. So when I hear people talking about what we need and we need our own black news and our own people, our coverage, y'all need to understand that stuff actually costs money. Staff costs money. Uh, the internet costs money. Uh, everything costs money. I told you last night, our Comcast bill to do fiber, to, to be sure, because remember, when we did the previous location, we got knocked off the air several times. Well, that alone is almost $3,000 to have the highest level uh, of, uh, of internet. This ain't, this ain't your home Wi-Fi, y'all. That's not what it is. And so, uh, and so just a perfect example of what the costs are for what we do. And so uh, that's why uh, it matters, and that's why your support absolutely matters. And so, again, if you give 50 bucks a year, that, that average is out to $4.19 a month, uh, 13 cents a day. That's what the average is out to, y'all. Uh, and so that's what I'm talking about uh, in terms of what we do. Uh, uh, Keenan just hit me a text. We are, we are at 49,074 downloads. We need 926 more to hit 50,000. Y'all should be downloading the app right now. And so, uh, so again, the giving part is critically important. Yes, I was on two advertising calls today, but that, but it's called conversation. That ain't actual money coming in. And so we are pressing hard uh, to drive the advertising revenue, uh, but that it is not easy when you're black owned media. Cause I told you 322 billion spent every year in black owned media, we're getting 0.5% of the 300. That's all black owned media. Y'all that's all black owned media. We're getting 0.5 to 1% of the 322 billion spent every single year. That's what we're fighting up against. Uh, and so that's what's going on. So please support us if you can. Uh, that's how you can actually give. And don't forget, you can get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available on Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, IndieBound, Bookshop, Chapters, uh, Books A Million, uh, Target. You can also, of course, download it from Audible and order it from your favorite black bookstore. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Libraries empower the community with education. Liberia Economic Development Initiative, LEDI, is hosting the International Life Changers Awards and Liberia's Bicentennial to celebrate LEDI building the country's first modern public library and technology center. Join event host Roland Martin, our honorees, Reverend Dr. Jamal Bryant, Zernona Clayton, Thomas Dorch Jr., Dana Lupton, Dr. Tammy Graysteel on October 29th at the CNN Center Atlanta. There are no public libraries in Liberia, but together we can change that. Get tickets at ledinow.org. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. You know what's on the ballot. It's not just legislation and policies we believe in. It's democracy. 
our democracy. There's a choice on the ballot between freedom and fear, between cruelty and compassion, between chaos and community, between voting or violence, and the end of rights generations have fought for. The extremists have a plan, a roadmap for a nation where your voice is silenced and your vote is a memory, where they count their votes and cast ours aside. That's why this year, this fight, this vote is so important. Register, engage, volunteer, fight back against the disinformation and despair, and most of all, vote, because your vote is all that stands between our future and theirs. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Vivian Green. Hi, this is Essence Atkins. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. All right, folks, so the January 6th committee that's investigating the white domestic terrorist attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021 held their final hearing today, uh, they showed even more damning evidence uh, of how complicit Donald Trump was in that particular day uh, to the point where the committee actually uh, issued a subpoena to uh, the orange one. Other witnesses have also gone to enormous lengths to avoid testifying about their dealings with Donald Trump. Steve Bannon has been tried and convicted by a jury of his peers for contempt of Congress. He is scheduled to be sentenced for this crime later this month. Criminal proceedings regarding Peter Navarro continue. And Mark Meadows, Donald Trump's former chief of staff, has refused to testify based upon executive privilege. The committee's litigation with him continues. Mr. Chairman, at some point, the Department of Justice may well unearth facts that these and other witnesses are currently concealing. But our duty today is to our country and our children and our Constitution. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. And every American is entitled to those answers so we can act now to protect our republic. So this afternoon, I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. If there's no further debate, the question is on agreeing to the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed is no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Cheney? Aye. Ms. Cheney? Aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. 
Uh, also during the he hearing, the committee showed never before seen the footage of what Democratic and Republican leaders were doing, how they were scurrying, trying to get some help. Donald Trump lied by saying Nancy Pelosi and others did nothing, called no one. Folks, this video, now we all know he a damn liar. We, we know he's a liar. He lies about lies. Uh, but this video shows you how scared they were, and it shows you how inept these people were, how ridiculous they were, uh, and frankly, how shameful they were. Watch this. So we're, st we're starting to get surrounded. They're taking the uh, north front scaffolding. Unless we get more munitions, we are not going to be able to hold. The door has been breached, and people are gaining access into the Capitol. <laughs> Senator Schumer is at a secure location, and they're locked down in the Senate. There has to be some way we can maintain the sense that people have that there's uh, some security or some confidence uh, that government can function and that we can elect the President of the United States. Did we go back into session? We did go back into session, but now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on tear gas masks to prepare for a breach. So I'm trying to get more information. They're putting on their tear gas masks. We need an area for the council members. They're all walking over now through the tunnels. I'm going to call up the effing secretary of DOD. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? I have something to say, Mr. Secretary. Well, I'm going to call the, the mayor of Washington, D.C. right now and see what... Uh, other outreach she has, other police departments, as Senator uh, Leader Hoyer has mentioned. Hi, Governor. Uh, this is Nancy. Uh, Governor, I don't know if you have been approached about the uh, Virginia National Guard. Mr. Hoyer was connect, uh, speaking to uh, uh, Governor Hogan. Uh, but I still think you probably need the okay of the, uh, the federal government in order to come into another jurisdiction. Thank you. Oh my God. They're just breaking windows. They're doing all, all kinds. Of, it's really that somebody, they said somebody was shot. It's just, it's just horrendous. And all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Okay, thank you, Governor. I appreciate what you're doing. And if you don't mind, I'd like to stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Virginia Guard has been called in. Yeah, and I'm just talking to Governor Northam. And what he said is they sent 200 of state police and a unit of the National Guard. They're breaking windows and going in, uh, uh, obviously ransacking our offices and all the rest of that. That's nothing. The, uh, the concern we have about uh, personal harm, safety, personal safety, is it just transcends everything. But the fact is, on any given day, they're breaking the law in many different ways, and quite frankly, much of it at the instigation of the president of the United States. And now. Uh, if he could, could at least uh, somebody. Yeah, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, and your law enforcement responsibility. A public statement they should all leave. This cannot be just we're waiting for so-and-so. We need them there now, whoever you got. You, have, okay. you also have troops, this is Stunning Hoyer, troops okay. so we have a Fort bit of time to make that Andrews Air Force Base, All right. other military bases. Thank you. We Thanks need Paul. active Bye. duty National Guard. How soon in the future can you have the place evacuated, closing out, cleaned out? 
Well, just pretend, just pretend for a moment it was the Winnebog or the White House or some other entity that was under siege. And let me say, you can logistically get people there as you make the plan. trying to figure out how we can get this job done today. We talked to Mitch about it earlier. Uh, he's not in the room right now, but he was with us earlier uh, and said, you know, we want to expedite this and hopefully they could confine it to just one complaint, Arizona, and then we could vote and, and that would be, you know, then just move forward with the rest of the state. The overriding wish is to do it at the Capitol. What we are being told very directly is it's going to take days for the Capitol to be okay again. We've gotten a very bad report about the condition of, of the um, house floor with defecation and all that kind of thing as well. I don't think that that's hard to clean up, but I do think it is uh, more from a security standpoint of making sure that everybody is out of the building and how long will that take. I just got off with the vice president. And I got off with the vice president-elect. So I'll tell okay. But what we left the conversation with, because he said he had the impression from Mitch that Mitch wants to get everybody back to do it there. Yes. I said, well, yeah. we're getting a counterpoint that is, we could take time uh, to clean up the poo poo that they're making all over the, literally and figuratively in the Capitol, and that uh, it may take days to get back. I'm at the Capitol building. I'm literally standing with uh, the chief of police of, uh, of the U.S. Capitol Police. He just informed me what you will hear through official channels. Paul Irving, your sergeant at arms, will inform you that their best information is that they believe that uh, 